We've come to see the birth of an iconic river at a time when our demands on water have reached a tipping point. These waters wrote the history of the American West. Today, that story is about a river facing collapse. Can you hear the sound it makes? Here we are. Ugh. Stand on the clump. This is going to sink here in a minute. What we're seeing here, this is really is the headwaters of the Colorado. This whole area is the beginning, and this is, there's probably tens or twenty of streams just like this to our right. Throughout this whole wetlands area, we'll see more streams like this. And so those streams then collectively gather together to create this raging torrent that becomes the, the Colorado River right. and the Grand Canyon that is the part of the river that everybody knows that about. That everybody knows, exactly. This river has just been carved up all the, all the way down the river to the sea. We've dammed it and diverted it and manipulated it and made the desert bloom. We're not going to have more water. So how do we manage it in a way that you have enough for people, you have enough for the environment, you have enough for recreation, enough for agriculture, but recognize that there's a limited amount. You know, they call Colorado, the state of Colorado, the mother of rivers because all these rivers flow out of it and none flow into it. And the truth is, really, she's a working mother. All of her <laughs> rivers are, are, well, almost all of them are dammed and utilized. It snows up here, that melts, comes downstream in the, in the spring and early summer with the snow melt. We capture it, we store it in reservoirs, and then we meet it out through the rest of the year. We've got about 191 projects throughout the 17 western United States, 345 dams, about 59 power plants. We're standing here at the first of the five power plants here on the east slope of the Rocky Mountains for the Colorado Big Thompson Project. So the sound that we're hearing right now is water rushing through this enormous tunnel underneath us. Right, and right. It came from across the mountain. It came underneath the Continental Divide. It's gone through a series of tunnels, and it's coming out right here. It's rushing underneath us into this pinstock. Like many western rivers, it just does not meet the expectations. And if we look at the, at the past, we have an open door to reconsider what is, a, what is a need and what is just a desire. There's so many uses of water we make that are entirely um, idiotic. Drinking fountains, yes, great miracle, much to be celebrated. Lawns that we spend such a great share of our lives cultivating and dealing with. Them. There's not enough for all of us to get what we want. There's enough for all of us to stay alive. There's enough for all of us to stay alive and also have some beauty in the in the world. And so, so we're free to choose. We raft it. We romanticize its grandeur. We marvel at the natural wonders carved out by its waters. On our trip, we take on 102 miles of river through wild rapids, and we visit ancestral Pueblo ruins preserved deep within canyon walls. At the confluence where the Green River comes in and meets up with the Colorado River. Come listen, and I'll tell a tale of hardy canyoneers that breed of men, the river rats who live without the fears of common ordinary men whose worries sure are small compared to those who flirt with death beneath that high gray wall what's in a man that makes him thirst for the kind of life he knows Oh, it's perfect. It is. He'll die a lonely river rat. I suppose that, that in some ways I'm like these ancestral Pueblans. I, I take my water from the headwaters. My well water is Colorado River water. To me, it is my children's and their children's future. and. Right now, we're, we're not thinking about our future. We're thinking about our own immediate needs. Can we continue to grow the way we have? We've only grown in Las Vegas and Los Angeles and Albuquerque and Denver because of this living resource. Are we destined for the same sort of civilization collapse, at least here in the Southwest, where, where water is, is not a resource, it's a living being? Mm -hmm. 
This wild river that seems so remote flows through all of our lives. It grows our cities, waters our lawns, and puts food on our tables. But with reservoirs like Lake Powell serving millions of people at the tap, our demands now outstrip the river's supply and strangle its flow to the sea. We've been traveling all the way from the headwaters to get here, but in so many ways it feels like the beginning of the end, in spite of the fact that this river continues on downstream. Yeah, it's a completely different feeling. The water's still here, but it is the death of a river. This river, even with its lakes, is the carotid artery to the west. And we cut the artery, we stop thinking about the balance, and all of a sudden the rest of the body dies. We have to keep the river flowing. We're at the edge of crisis, but we still have choices. I don't think we'll have those choices in 2030. The status quo will not be acceptable for the future, and I would hate to have that be our legacy, that we, we witness the moment in time when the river can no longer meet our needs and no longer nourish us. We've engineered this great river to feed the farms and cities that provide life for millions. But from the moment it begins in the Rockies, its waters have been over-allocated. Now, there is a choice before us. Unless we balance our demands and restore living rivers for our children, our story, on this river, will continue towards collapse. Let it flow. Restore the glories down below. Let the waters be set free. Let this mighty river